Chapter Three, Richard the Second. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of Art for Young People by Agnes Ethel Conway and Sir Martin Conway. Chapter Three, Richard the Second. Our first picture is a portrait of Richard the Second on his coronation day in the year thirteen seventy seven, when he was ten years old. It is the earliest one selected, and the eyes of those who see it for the first time will surely look surprised. The jewel like effect of the sapphire winged angels and coral robed Richard against the golden background is not at all what we are accustomed to see. Nowadays it may take some time and a little patience before we can cast ourselves back to the year 1377 and look at the picture with the eyes of the person who painted it. Let us begin with a search for his purpose and meaning, at least. The picture is a diptych, that is to say, it is a painting done upon two wings or shutters hinged so as to allow of their being closed together. You have no doubt been wondering why I called it a portrait, for the picture is far from being what to-day would commonly be described as such. Richard himself is not even the most conspicuous figure, and he is kneeling and praying to the Virgin. What should we think if any living sovereign, ordering a state portrait, had himself portrayed, surrounded on one side by his predecessors on the throne, and on the other side by the Virgin and Child and Angels? But in the fourteenth century it was nothing strange that the Virgin and Child, the Angels, John the Baptist, Edward the Confessor, Edmund the Martyr, and Richard the Second should be thus depicted. When we have realized that it was usual for a royal patron to command, and an artist to paint such an assemblage of personages, as though all of them were then living and in one another's presence, we have learnt something significant and impressive about a way of thinking in the Middle Ages. Richard the Second thought of himself as the successor of a long line of kings, appointed by the divine power to rule a small portion of the divine territories. So what more natural than that he, as the newly reigning sovereign, should have his portrait painted surrounded by his holiest predecessors upon the throne, and in the act of dedicating his kingdom to the Virgin Mary? In an account given of his coronation we read that, after the ceremony in Westminster Abbey, Richard went to the shrine of Our Lady at Pew, nearby, where he made a special offering to Our Lady of eleven angels, each wearing the king's badge, one for each of the eleven years of his young life. What form this offering of angels took we know not. They may have been little wooden figures, or coins with an angel stamped upon them, but it is reasonable to connect the offering with this very picture of Our Lady and the angels. The king's special badges were the white heart, and the collar of broom-pods, which you see embroidered all over his magnificent red robe. The white heart is pinned in the form of a jewel beneath his collar, and each of the eleven angels bears the badge upon her shoulder, and the collar of broom-pods round her neck. One of the king's angels gives the royal standard of England, with the cross of St. George on it, to the infant Christ, in token of Richard's dedication of his kingdom to the Virgin and Child. Edward the Third died at midsummer, thirteen seventy seven, and Richard succeeded him in his eleventh year, having been born on january sixth, thirteen sixty seven. It is necessary to note the exact day of the year when these events took place, for it can have importance in determining the saint whom a personage chiefly honoured as patron and protector. In this instance, St. John the Baptist, whose feast occurs on june twenty third, near to the day of Richard's accession, obviously stands as patron saint of the young king. Next to him is King Edward the Confessor, the founder of Westminster Abbey, who was canonized for his sanctity, and who points to Richard the Second as his spiritual successor upon the throne. In medieval art, the saints are distinguished by their emblems, which often have an association with the grim way in which they met their death, or with some other prominent feature in their legend. Here Edward holds up a ring, whereof a pretty story is told. Edward once took it off his finger to give it to a beggar, because he had no money with him. But the beggar was no other than John the Evangelist in disguise, and two years later he sent the ring back to the king with the message that, in six months, Edward would be in the joy of heaven with him. 
William Caxton, the first English printer, relates in his life of King Edward that when he heard the message he was full of joy, and let fall tears from his eyes, giving praise and thanksgiving to Almighty God. St. Edmund, who stands next to Edward the Confessor, is the other saintly king of England, after whom the town of Bury St. Edmunds takes its name. He was shot to death with arrows by the Danes, because he would not give up Christianity. If I could show you several suitably chosen pictures at once, you would recognize in the arrangement of the three kings here, two standing, one kneeling before the Virgin and Child, a plain resemblance to the typical treatment of a well-known subject, the adoration of the Magi. You remember how when the three wise men of the East, always thought of in the Middle Ages as kings, had followed the star which led them to the manger where Christ was born, they brought him gold and frankincense and myrrh as offerings. This beautiful story was a favourite one in the Middle Ages, often represented in sculpture and painting. One king always kneels before the virgin and child, presenting his gift, whilst the other two stand behind with theirs in their hands. The standing kings and the kneeling Richard in our picture are grouped in just the same relation to the divine infant as the three magi. The imitation of the type is clear. There was a special reason for this, in that the birthday of Richard fell upon January 6th, the feast of the Epiphany, when the wise men did homage to the babe. The picture, by reminding us of the three wise men, commemorated the birthday of the king, as well as his coronation, the two chief dates of his life. You have some idea now of the train of thought which this fourteenth-century painter endeavoured to express in his picture commemorative of the coronation of a king. A medieval coronation was a very solemn ceremony indeed, and the picture had to be a serious expression of the great traditions of the throne of England, suggested by the figures of St. Edward and St. Edmund, and of hope for future good to the realm, to ensue from the blessings of the virgin and child upon the young king. Religious feeling is dominant in this picture, and if from it you could turn to others of like date, you would find the same to be true. The meaning was the main thing thought of. When Giotto painted his scenes from the life of St. Francis, his first aim was that the stories should be well told and easily grasped by all who looked at them. Their beauty was of less importance. This difference between the aim of art in the Middle Ages and in our own day is fundamental. If you begin by picking to pieces the pictures of the thirteenth and fourteenth centuries because the drawing is bad, the colouring crude, and the grouping unnatural, you might as well never look at them at all. Putting faults and old fashions aside to think of the meaning of the picture, we shall often be rewarded by finding a soul within, and the work may affect us powerfully, notwithstanding its simple forms and few strong colours. Nevertheless, after the painter had planned his picture so as to convey its message and meaning, he did try to make it beautiful to look upon, and he often succeeded. In the thirteenth and fourteenth centuries it was beauty of outline, and a pleasant patching together of bright colours for which the painter strove, both in pictures and in manuscripts. If you think of this picture for a moment as a coloured pattern, you will see how pretty it is. The blue wings against the gold background make a hedge for the angel faces, and look extremely well. If the figure of Richard the Second seems flat, if you feel as though he were cut out of cardboard and had no thickness, then turn your mind to consider only the outline of the figure. It is very graceful. Artists in the thirteenth century sometimes made their figures overlong if they thought that a sweep of graceful line would look well in a certain position in their picture. The drapery was bent into impossible curves, if so, they fell into a pretty pattern. In the fourteenth century, beauty of outlines still prevailed, even when they contained plain masses of brilliant colour, so pure and gem-like that the pictures almost came to look like stained-glass windows. In fact, probably the constant sight of stained-glass windows in the churches greatly influenced the painter's way of work. The contrast of diverse colours placed next one another was more startling than we find in later painting, whilst an effort was made to finish every detail as though it were to be looked at through a magnifying glass. In this picture, which we are now learning how to see, the Virgin was shown to be standing in a meadow of flowers. A modern artist knows how to paint the general effect of many flowers growing out of grass, 
but the medieval painter had not the skill to do that. He had not learnt to look at the effect of a mass of flowers as a whole, nor could he have rendered such an effect with the colours and processes he possessed. He knew what one flower looked like, and thought that many must be a continued repetition of one. But it was impossible to paint a great number of flowers close together, each finished in detail, so he chose instead to paint a few, as completely as he could, and leave the rest to the imagination of the spectator. That was his way of making a selection from nature. Thus he hoped to suggest the idea of a flowery meadow, since he could not hope to render the look of it. Likewise all the details of the dresses are minutely painted. The robes of Richard and of Edmund the Martyr are beautiful examples of the careful and painstaking work characteristic of the Middle Ages. No medieval painter spared himself trouble. Although he had not mastered the art of drawing the figure, he had learnt how to paint jewellery and stuffs beautifully, and delighted in doing it. The drawing of the figures you can see to be imperfect, yet nothing could be sweeter in feeling than the bevy of girl angels with roses in their hair surrounding the Virgin. Most of them are not unlike English girls of the present day, and the critics who say that this picture must have been painted by a Frenchman may be asked where he is likely to have found these English models for his angels. Possibly the face of Richard himself may have been painted from life, for the features correspond closely enough with the large full-face portrait of him in Westminster Abbey, and with the sculptured figure upon his tomb. He certainly does not look like a child of ten, for his state robes and crown give him a grown-up appearance, but if you regard the face carefully, you can see that it is still that of a child. The gold background in the original shines out brilliantly, for after the gold was laid on it was polished with an agate, which gives it a burnished effect, and then the little patterns were carefully punched, so as not to pierce the gold and thereby expose the white ground beneath. There is a jewel-like quality in the colour such as you can see in manuscripts of the time, and it is possible that the painter may have learned his art as an illuminator of manuscripts. Artists in those days seldom confined themselves to one kind of work. We do not know this man's name, and are not even certain whether he was French or English. Before, as in the time of Richard, painting had been mainly a decorative art, and the object of making pictures was to adorn the pages of a book, or the walls and vaults of a building. The most vital artistic energies of Western Europe in the thirteenth century had gone into the building of the great cathedrals and abbeys, which are to-day the glory of that period. Most medieval paintings that still exist in England are decorative wall paintings of this kind, and only traces of a few remain. In many country places you can see poor and faded vestiges of painting which adorned church walls in the thirteenth century, and occasionally you may come upon a bit by some chance better preserved. These old wall paintings were done upon the dry plaster. The discovery, or rather the revival of fresco painting, that is, of painting done upon the wet surface of freshly plastered walls, a more durable process, was made in Italy, and did not penetrate to England. Richard II was not the only art-loving king of his time, you have read of John, King of France, who was taken prisoner at the Battle of Poitiers by the Black Prince, father of Richard. During his captivity he lived in considerable state in London at the Savoy Palace, which occupied the site of the present Savoy Hotel in the Strand. He brought his own painter from France with him, who painted his portrait, which still exists in Paris. This King John was the father of four remarkable sons, Charles V, King of France, with whom Edward III and the Black Prince fought the latter part of the Hundred Years' War, Philip the Bold, Duke of Burgundy, John, Duke of Berry, and Louis, Duke of Anjou. In this list all are names of remarkable men and great art patrons, about whom you may some day read interesting things. Numerous lovely objects still in existence were made for them, and would not have been made at all if they had not been the men they were. It was only just becoming possible in the fourteenth century for a prince to be an art patron. That required money, and hitherto even princes had rarely been rich. The increasing wealth of England, France, and Flanders at this time was based upon the wool industry, 
and the manufacture and commerce to which it gave rise. The Lord Chancellor in the House of Lords to this day sits on a wool sack, which is a reminder of the time when the wool sacks of England were the chief source of the wealth of English traders. After the Black Death, an awful plague that swept through Europe in 1349, a large part of the land of England was given up to sheep grazing, because the population had diminished and it took fewer people to look after sheep than it did to till the soil. Although this had been an evil in the beginning, it became afterwards a benefit, for English wool was sold at an excellent price to the merchants of Flanders, who worked it up into cloth, and in their turn sold that all over Europe with big profits. The larger merchants who regulated the wool traffic were prosperous, and so too the landowners and princes whose property thus increased in value. The four sons of King John became very wealthy men. Philip the Bold, Duke of Burgundy, by marrying the heiress of the Count of Flanders, acquired the Flemish territory, and the wealth obtained from the wool trade and manufacture there. Berry and Anjou were great provinces in France, yielding a large revenue to their two dukes. Each of these princes employed several artists to illuminate books for him in the most splendid way. They built magnificent chateaux, and had tapestries and paintings made to decorate their walls. They employed many sculptors and goldsmiths, and all gave each other as presents works of art executed by their favorite artists. In the British Museum there is a splendid gold and enamel cup that John, Duke of Berry, caused to be made for his brother, King Charles V. To see it would give you a good idea of the costliness and elaboration of the finest work of that day. The courts of these four brothers were centres of artistic production in all kinds, sculpture, metalwork, tapestries, illuminated manuscripts and pictures, and there was a strong spirit of rivalry among the artists, to see who could make the loveliest things, and among the patrons, as to which could secure the best artists in his service. These four princes gave an important impulse to the production of beautiful things in France, Burgundy, and Flanders, but it is needless to burden you with the artists' names. In the fourteenth century an artist was a workman, who existed to do well the work that was desired of him. He was not an independent man with ideas of his own, who attempted to make a living by painting what he thought beautiful, without reference to the ideas of a buyer. Of course, if people prefer and buy good things when they see them, good things will be likely to be made. But if those with money to spend have no taste and buy bad things, or order ugly things to be made, then the men who had it in them to be great artists may die unnoticed because the beautiful things they could have made are not called for. Today many people spend something upon art, and a few spend a great deal. Let us hope we may not see too much of the money spent in creating a demand for what is bad, rather than for what is beautiful. It was not unusual in the fourteenth century for a man to be at one and the same time painter, illuminator, sculptor, metal worker, and designer of any object that might be called for. One of these many gifted men, André Bonneveau of Valenciennes, a good sculptor and a painter of some exquisite miniatures, is sometimes supposed to have been the painter of our picture of Richard II. In the absence of any signature or any definite record, it is impossible to say who painted it, but it is unnecessary to assume that it must have been painted by a French artist, since we know that at the end of the fourteenth century there were very good painters in England. It was by no means an exception not to sign a picture in those days, for the artists had not begun to think of themselves as individuals entitled to public fame. Handworkers of the fourteenth century mostly belonged to a corporation, or guild, composed of all the other workers at the same trade in the same town, and to this rule artists were no exception. Each man received a recognized price for his work, and the officers of the guild saw to it that he obtained that price, and that he worked with good and durable materials. There were certain advantages in this, but it involved some loss of freedom in the artist, since all had to conform to the rules of the guild. This system was characteristic of the Middle Ages, and arose from the fact that in those troublous times every isolated person needed protection, 
and was content to merge his individuality in some society in order to obtain it. The guilds made for peace and diminished competition, so that a guildsman may have been less tempted to hurry over or scamp his task. The result was much honest, careful work, such as you see in the original of this picture. We are told by those who know best that there has never been a time when the actual workmanship of the general run of craftsmen was better than in the Middle Ages. This picture of Richard the Second has not faded, or cracked, or fallen off the panel, and it seems as though we may hope it never will, for it was well made, and, what is even more important, it seems always to have been well cared for. If only the nice things that are produced were all well cared for, how many more of them there would be in the world? End of chapter 3 Read by Kara Schallenberg www.kray.org On March 18, 2008 In San Diego, California